everyone, and welcome to another episode of Maestro Moments. Super excited to bring on our first guest, Cynthia Johnson Turner. Cindy, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you being here. I'm delighted to be here, Aaron. Thank you for the invitation. And if, for your listeners and watchers, uh, I'm back in Canada, so that's why I have a fleece on and I'm sitting by the fire. <laughs> there you go. I guess it is, uh, it's a lot different from being down in Athens, right? A little different. Especially, yeah. especially this time of year. Yeah, not quite as humid. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all, it's all good. It was a gorgeous day today. It's just that I'm in a basement right now. So, so let's let's kind of start with that because you've had a uh, you know prior to COVID when when COVID hit uh, you know this conversation kind of started up because I read the article that you wrote for Bill Perrine's The Future of the Wind Band and you know when you were writing that you were the director of bands at University of Georgia or you know when that book was I don't know if you were actually writing it during that time period but uh, okay and you've had like a a major transition since then. So uh, tell us a little bit about that transition. Oh, man. Yeah, you could call it. You could call it that. I'm in a really hard job right now. Yeah. And uh, it's been a year. I, yeah, I, I, I threw my hat in the ring for Dean of uh, at the Faculty of Music at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario, which is about a, a 45, 50 minutes outside of Toronto, east of, uh, west of Toronto. And I got it. Uh, and uh, then it was like, uh oh, <laughs> it's like that last, it's that last, I don't know if you've seen the movie, Can The Candidate with Robert Redford. I'm probably dating myself, but the whole movie is him campaigning and then he gets the he gets elected and his right. <laughs> somebody in the movie says, now what? That's kind of how I feel. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. It's fun to build stuff. We just hired Kevin Day. Right. Uh, uh, I cannot announce who we just hired to do an a, a 18-month position of our wind ensemble job, which will then search for the full-time position, but it is also very exciting. That I had no idea how much fun it was to hire amazing people. That's, that's really fun to build stuff. It's big picture stuff. It's uh, learning a lot about music therapy, which, of course, has become so, so important you know, during the pandemic, I think it's, yeah, it, it's really where a lot of it's where it's at. I mean, most of us in music understand the value of music therapy, right? Yeah. We, that's why we do it. Yeah. We're getting therapy while we're doing our jobs, which is pretty special. Yeah. That's, that is true. I, and it speaks to what the band really is in a lot of ways, you know, uh, and, you know, throughout that book, uh, the future of the wind band talking about the, the focus of the ensemble and the students that we teach and, you know, especially at the high school level, you know, I am lucky to have one, two, maybe three or four students a year decide to pursue music as a career. But the vast majority of those kids are going to be, you know, doctors, lawyers, teachers, uh, mailmen, everything under the sun. And, you know, what we do in the classroom, it's so much of an internal aspect of who they are and that developmental stuff. And in a lot of ways, it is therapy for them, especially coming out of COVID. Yeah, I love that. I'm just going to say male people just so that we're like gender neutral. Right. <clears throat> and, and I say that because the person that delivers our mail is uh, identifies as female and she's awesome. But anyway, uh, I couldn't agree more. It's a wonderful way to put it. And it, it really it's not that much different schools of music. We're, I mean, I don't want to get too critical, but a lot of schools of music are training their students, uh, imagining them getting the chair in whatever symphony, right? Uh, right. Really, it's a small percentage of students that get the gig. Uh, at Georgia, we had a lot of students getting military gigs, which is fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. Some students got some, you know, local orchestra or regional orchestra gigs, but our curriculum is still, you know, like high school, right? That is, is around that these people are going to be professional performers. Yeah, maybe, right? So yeah. I think we need to be thinking about that as well. Another attraction of this deanship was to have, this is a faculty of, of very innovative folks who will want to have those conversations and what can we be do what can we be doing differently for our students? What partnerships can we make? 
yeah, it's, it's super exciting what's happening at Laurier, but um, I, I love how you've put that. I mean, we, we tend to think of what we do as, as the be all and end all. We tend to think of it as uh, our, I, I don't know how many times on Facebook and other socials, I've seen things like, I wanna do this with my band. Right. Uh, I can't wait to play this piece. Things right. like that, as music educators and conductors. Well, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's think about who's who, who who are in our ensembles, right? And how are we serving them? Yeah, and that's maybe that's a uh, um, before we kind of get into some of those heavy topics. I want to talk a little bit uh, about you know your career oh, sorry. and where you get more heavy. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that that is that's that's a valid question. And you know, this is something that if you had asked me. 15 years ago when I was younger in my career and really, you know, much more of a dictator on the podium than what I am now. Uh, it, it would have been, you know, in a lot of ways, that podium was my sole artistic outlet. And for me, the, the repertoire for me as a musician was very important to me. And, uh, you know, now that I've gotten older, I, Yes, it is still important for me as a conducting musician, but, you know, the choices that I make, am I really fulfilling the needs of the students that I'm teaching, you know? Yeah, I mean, it takes a long time. It took me a long time to figure that out, right? It uh, was with you. I, I called myself a benevolent dictator, and that was all about ego, right? right. Because you know, we are judged by the quality of our students. Sure. That's how it is. Um you know, the basketball coach can say, oh, it's a building year, but it, if, right. if the band doesn't sound good, it's a problem, right? And that that's, comes back to our ego. Yeah. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out who I was, right? That's extremely important. Um, and getting that in check, getting the ego in check, that it's about the students and not about me. Um, you can still have standards and excellence and right. uh, you, can, you can have conversations about what that is. Uh, and not choosing music that's too hard all the time and all that sort of stuff. But it took me a long time to figure out that no one in my ensemble wants to sound bad. Right. I mean, it seems silly to say that, but it's not like somebody's trying to sound bad. And so therefore, no amount of yelling or berating or fear, or whatever I, that I did, and I did, is going to make it sound better. In fact, those, right. often those students quit the band. Oops. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you talked about a little bit about your growth and where you are today with at Laurier, Laurier, excuse me. That's okay. Such an American. That's just, that's okay. <laughs> just, just think of the name Laurie. Laurier. And yeah. then think Canada, eh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Laurier. <laughs> you got it. Forget, forgive my American, uh, Southern Sorry. American issues. But uh, so let's talk. So, you know, when we met a few years ago, you know, you, in, in my eyes, as coming to meet you, you know, all I see is the product that you produce, which is phenomenal. I see you grace the cover of the instrumentalists. Uh, I mean, you are at the top of your game uh, and, you know, at the top of our profession as band directors and everything. So one of the things that I like to do on these maestro moments is kind of dig in to see where you came from, which you know, you are back home now in Canada, not home home, but, uh, you know, back in uh, the place where you kind of hail from. So tell us a little bit about that journey. What, what was school like in Canada as opposed to maybe what you saw in the U.S. and what took you to where you are now? Uh, yeah. Um, how long do we have? I mean, it, I, I, mean it, I, I will say I don't think that there's any one pathway to to success or to anyone's version of success. And the story I'm about to tell, and I'll keep it brief, uh, isn't anybody else's story and shouldn't be anybody else's story. So, but uh, I think that I think that a lot of young people entering the, the profession think that they have to they have to do their bachelor's here at this school, and then they need to teach for three or four years, and then they need to do their master's here, and that, that this seems to be the formula, right? And then they need to do their doctorate here because the schools you go to open as many doors as they close, and every DOB has a pedigree and blah, 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 blah. Um, I think that I, 
did it a little differently. I mean, yes, Canada is a very different scene. I'll, I'll never forget the first time that I was a kid um, in, in our wind ensemble in Peterborough, Ontario, Crestwood High School. Uh, the band director was my stepfather. Don't get me started on that story. That's a whole other, you know, <laughs> it's a whole other therapy session. But anyway, um, excellent band. Uh, and we went on, on our, my first tour and I walked into, I think it was a band room in New York state and there were trophies all over the place in the band room. And as a Canadian, that's just what, that's crazy. What do you, why are there trophies here? That's like for the basketball team, the football team or gymnastics or whatever. So the whole concept of competition and art, competition and music is a fairly foreign or literally foreign concept to Canadians um, who, and it's not like every, you get a participation trophy, um, but the actual trophies for a music performance is odd, is odd to, to Canadians. Um, I shouldn't speak for all Canadians. I mean, it was from this kid from Ontario. It was pretty weird. Right. So that's one aspect, the aspect of competition and art, competition and music making is, is different. Um, I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I do think leaning too far on the side of competition can actually create the kind of students that we were talking about earlier that are fearful and, uh, you know, want to get the A, want to get the gold, want to get the trophy, and therefore they're, they're not thinking about the holistic experience, the community experience, the beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I was a high school student. I, I, I wanted to be a vet until I took my first biology class and went, well, that's not going to work out. Um, so uh, my music was my, was my community, right? I felt very safe. I had my, my boyfriend, plural, I guess, uh, was in the band. Not at the same time, I should say. Oh, my gosh, too much information. Um, I mean, these were my, my best friends were there, you know, the, at, at this particular school. They were, they were, and I think back on it, there were definitely cliques, cliques, you would say, in America, where, you know, they were the, they were the jocks, they were the band kids, they were the smart right. kids, all that sort of stuff. Um, so my clique, clique was, was definitely music. Anyway, um, I, I uh, graduated from Queen's University in Kingston. And I immediately got a job in Switzerland. I made, back before the internet, y'all, I sent out <laughs> hundreds of letters that I typed on a typewriter. Um, and I got a job offer uh, in Japan, Switzerland, and Papua New Guinea. And I took the gig in Switzerland because they were going to pick me up in the airport on, in, a, in a limousine. And I just thought, well, that's pretty cool. So I taught music, choral music, and computers in French and aerobics now I'm really dating myself, Jane Fonda, uh, in Switzerland at a private girl's school while I studied French literature in the morning. Awesome. I uh, came back, did middle school for two years just outside of Toronto, loved it. But then I got my dream job, Parkside High School in Dundas, Ontario. I was head of a music department. Why would you leave that gig? That was my, that's all I wanted to do. Right. I was very proud of the fact that in a school of a thousand, I had 350 in the band program. That's awesome. I know. I look back on that and go, that's awesome. But today I'm going, why didn't I have a thousand in the program? Right. Why didn't I have a thousand students in my music program? Why? So, because I focused on band and choir and guitar. And there were a lot of things that I was doing in that high school band program that didn't necessarily appeal to all the students in the school. But everybody digs music. Everybody has a right, right to music. Um, and then... Uh, so... I I'm sorry. So that first uh, high school gig, you were you were the were you the sole music teacher at the high school or? No, I started out uh, as the actually the third music teacher. Then I was the second, and then I became head of the music program there. Okay, and uh, you were teaching band, choir, and guitar, or? I never taught guitar. That would be a frightful thing. No, <laughs> I, I, taught, uh, I actually just did the band, I, and yeah, that was it. Uh, and there were three bands. And again, music in Ontario is very different. So you, I worked it out. I, I got sneaky and strategic, but you actually don't have, like you do in a lot of places in the States, band as a class. It's music class. You have your grade nine, your grade 10, your grade 11, your grade 12. So, or grade 13 back in the day. And so I had to have my wind ensemble, which had grade nine students and grade 12 students in it at 7am or after school at 
four thirty. Oh wow! That's, and and um, yeah, and the other big culture change coming back to Ontario is the union culture. And so the year that I went off to do my master's at the University of Victoria was the year that the entire province of Ontario. So imagine every school in your state going on strike, kindergarten oh, wow. to well, were universities? No, not universities. Kindergarten to high school. Every teacher walked. And I was at UVic figuring out I knew absolutely nothing about music and conducting and leadership um, and came back and I couldn't wait to get started. And the culture was very uh, negative and bitter. Right. And um, so I couldn't have my morning rehearsals, right? Because it was work to rule, but I did anyway. Um, learned a lot there. Not sure I'd do the same thing. Oh, I probably would because it was about the students. And um, you know, that, uh, that's interesting to me because, you know, one of my good friends, Keith Kelly, who is a band director in Ireland, he has a great podcast. He's got the international band room. Uh, he's actually in uh, Indianapolis right now with the Calgary show band, the um, Stampede show band with them down at uh, DCI Internationals and stuff like that. Wonderful band director. But public education, including a band class, I don't think Americans realize how unique and rare that is on a global aspect, you know? Yeah. That having that as part of our curriculum within the high school, and, and in some ways it's, it's kind of scary that we don't take it more seriously and to be more inclusive. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's tied into, in, in most States, it's tied into football, right? I mean, if, right. of course you need a band class, uh, which, which is not a thing in, in at least in Ontario. I won't, well, it's most of the provinces. I mean, football, first of all, Canadian football, there are three downs. So we look at your American football and go, four downs, give me a break. <laughs> and it's a bigger uh, field, but it is. Yeah, yeah, it's so it's so linked. It's it's so linked to the athletic program. We forget that yeah. uh, in a lot of states, right? That that this is the most visible, most um, uh, what's the word of it? The, the most viewed part of the band program is when it is tied to the football. And one of the right. things that has hurt, I think, that has hurt band, and we're going to get talked to the future of wind band, is forgetting that in in our in our uh, effort to elevate the medium, right? I mean, certainly we call them the turtlenecks way back, right? I mean, you, you could you could this has also been a problem in higher ed for sure. College band directors uh, playing music that was you know was. Uh, <laughs> Not what was happening on the field, I'll say that. Right. And disconnect between what was happening on the field and what what was happening on the stage. I mean, Bob Reynolds and I have some amazing discussions about that. Um, and in the effort to elevate the wind ensemble and its art and its repertoire, which is a great thing, it's of course we should do that. I think we've done some damage in terms of what people want to listen to, and more importantly, are we serving our our students? So, um, you know. I'm glad you said that because that's something that, and I mentioned this when we were talking on, I think it was uh, when we had Travis on talking about uh, the section on relevance in uh, the wind band from that uh, book. And I, I, and I, I'm talking about this as somebody who is judged for us fans. I love judging those really competitive core styles. Uh, and, you know, as a band director, I love it when I hear a really innovative show on the field. I love, uh, you know, and even when you take, uh, you know, you hear Mackie or you hear to Kelly on the field, it's exhilarating. It's awesome. It's amazing. But I'm talking as somebody who spent the vast majority of his life as music as a central role in his life. So, and I've always... As I got older, I realized that sometimes we're shooting ourselves in the foot from by putting that in a halftime show at a football game when the vast majority of our audience has 
doesn't know who uh, to Kelly is, doesn't know who John Mackey is. Uh, you know, if they know uh, who Holst is, they probably know him because of the planets. Uh, and, you know, most people don't know who Holst is anymore. And, you know, from that perspective, that being the most visible aspect of our program, how much are we connecting with the people that make the decisions about the funding for our programs? Because those people are going to go out and vote on that bond referendum, those people in the stands. And if are they going to see your band as a vital part of the community? Uh, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, we could get, we could talk all night about repertoire. Uh, and <laughs> Uh, and inclusivity. I mean, the latest, the latest thing on Facebook, right? Uh, and that I, you know, I'm like, do not respond, do not respond, do not respond. I have to say it, you know. I mean, the, you know, somebody's going to talk about artistic merit in three, two, one. There it is. That's why we're not programming, you know, uh, underrepresented composers. So, you know, that that concept of relevance and what we do as it relates to the marching band, DCI, whatever. Uh, and wind ensemble is a very, very important topic. And I think that there's lots of aspects to it. Repertoire is one. How we speak to audience and how we educate our audience is another. Um, where we perform is another. I mean, we most college wind ensembles, at least in my experience, stayed in their concert hall. The two or three concerts, in my case, sometimes four per, semest per semester in Hudson Concert Hall, right? Or in Bailey Hall when I was at Cornell. Um, finally, we started going out, right? Uh, tours, prisons. Um, uh, that That's another aspect of relevance, 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 getting the ensemble off the, out of the ivory tower, right. <clears throat> doing things that are meaningful and connecting with community. I mean, universities were founded for the public good. Let's not forget that, right? Yeah. And let, let's think about that in terms of what we're doing on the stage or elsewhere. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think that the, the really the hardest project, there were a lot of projects going on in Georgia. The hardest one to walk away from when I took this gig was the hip hop harmonic project. Connie Frigo, who is a creative genius, saxophone professor at Georgia. And I sort of conceived this, uh, what if, you know, uh, a, a Hudson uh, University academic composer teamed up with a hip hop artist in Athens, Georgia? Because here's the Hudson School of Music sitting in Athens, Georgia, the one of the most incredibly uh, important alternative music scenes in the country, if not North America. And what do you think the relationship between is the Hudson School of Music and this, um, alternative music scene in Athens, Georgia. Nothing, zero, very little, right? So how do we, how do we make that happen? And uh, it's happening, right? And so there are now a series of performances and, and, and compositions written for Athens, co-composed. Right. Not, I shouldn't say written for, co-composed by hip hop artists in Athens and Peter Van Zantley and Emily Coe uh, at, at Georgia. And they're fantastic. Um, it's hard. That is very, that's very difficult, important, critical, meaningful, necessary, relevant work that more right. students so, should do. And, you know, even at, at the secondary level, I'm thinking as a high school band director, what are ways that I can expand the horizons of the music experiences within the larger school base? And when I hear about something like that, and you know, uh, there are several, I used to live close to the DC area and there's some classical artists up there that do some chamber work and they'll uh, interact with hip hop artists and stuff like that. But it really hasn't, well, as a teacher, I, I'm thinking, you know, how relevant would that make that band experience for the students that are in band, but also, as a teacher, think about the sounds that you would be exposing to someone who is specializing solely in hip hop and R&B to these new sounds that they may not have considered in that 
genre to expand the palette with which you're creating these awesome beats and these awesome samples and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I mean, it, may, it might not be hip hop in, right. in, in your community. It might be mariachi. All these mariachi bands are, in, are, are, are cropping up in a lot of schools in California. Love that. Uh, take it a step further. Are there, are there pieces that could be written for mariachi and wind band or, right. or mariachi and chamber ensemble? I mean, we have to think about too the students in our ensemble. Representation matters. I know that that's a you know a buzz term right now, but it does matter, right? And it so, um, you know, and let's face it: how many of our students are going home and listening to band music? Right. I mean, we do because we're we're geeks that way. But you know, um, you know, what are, what are they listening to, and how can we how can we tap into that? Uh, and it doesn't mean we p play you know, whatever arrangements of whatever tune, because we think that that's how we're going to reach the students. No, go, go at it at, at a different way. Right. I mean, another, another really cool collaboration. And I think I can, I think I can spill these beans. Um, Kevin Day is collaborating with a spoken word artist. Awesome. From Athens, Georgia to compose an opera. Oh, and wow. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to say what city that's happening in, but it's major. And uh, they just secured some very interesting things. Like, that's what I'm talking about. That, yeah. that kind of co-collaboration that creates, uh, either expands a genre or creates a new genre or embraces the fact that we have entered in the 21st century a genreless. We're breaking down genres. Right. What, is right. that, what does that mean for the wind band? And what could it mean, right? And we also talk about the 21st century as if that's innovative and new. We're we're a generation in, so come on, you know, let's. And and I just listened, Aaron. I just listened yesterday, tuned into ASCAP Labs and New York Media Labs on music in the metaverse. Holy smokes! Yeah. I mean, that is a game changer, right? I mean, we're talking about we're talking about Star Wars, the original Star Wars when uh, Princess Leia was a hologram. That's happening. That science fiction is today. Yeah. What could that mean? What, why, could we be talking about campuses that just have rooms where you can go into a metaverse instead of spending zillions of dollars on new buildings? I don't know, but I think we, we have to have these conversations. The, the so-called alternative and pop world are so far ahead of us in this kind of thinking. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, I got to, we got to take a quick break to uh, do a little ad from Amano Music. And then when we come back, I've got a special guest that's going to join us, Dr. Jonathan Paquette, which I think you uh, know a little bit about him. Yeah, you may have uh, <laughs> met him once or twice before, but uh, when we'll be back, we'll, uh, Jonathan will be joining us. Awesome. Windconductor.org's Maestro Moments is brought to you tonight through the support of Amato Music. Amato Music is a collective for composers and a resource to band directors. Find the very best in wind band repertoire from classic marches updated and edited for contemporary wind ensembles to the latest from innovative independent composers like the piece you're listening to right now, Chatterbox by Jason McChristian. You will also find resources for the band classroom, including books on topics important to band directors, as well as methods like mastering the scales to prepare your band to tackle rigorous repertoire. You can find Amano Music by visiting their website at www.amanomusic.com. That's Amano Music with a double A. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Really appreciate it. Cindy, it's always great to see you. So, uh, Jonathan, uh, this is the first time we've had you on. Tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're at, and all that. Yeah, my name is Jonathan Poquette. I'm the director of bands at Elon University in Elon, North Carolina. North Carolina. Get my Canadian accent there. <laughs> uh, from North Carolina. And... Um, yeah, before before that, I taught middle school and high school band for four years before I pursued my master's degree at the University of Central Missouri. And then I was fortunate enough to uh, pursue my doctorate at the University of Georgia with with the boss up there, Cindy Josh Turner. She's the main, awesome. she's the best. And so, yeah, and so Elon, North Carolina is uh, the first job outside of the doctorate. And it's been awesome to, to start applying some of these 
pedigrees that Cindy kind of helped shed the light on, but also, you know, try to become myself and, and apply that and just make a difference here in Eli. Awesome. So I, I'm curious to get some of your thoughts on that. Uh, you know, we, we talked about a lot uh, in the first part of the show today. Uh, and I'm interested to hear because I, uh, you know, you're, you kind of represent the next generation of professors and conductors uh, that have come out uh, and are moving us further into the 21st century. So what is, what are some of the things as you were listening to us talk and stuff, what are some of the things that maybe popped out and got you thinking? Oh, Aaron, where to begin, right? There were so many great things, but I think in general, for me, I think it's about developing a, a relationship and a community in, in, the, in, the, in the job, whether you're teaching high school, middle school or college here, you know, we've got to get to know our students and who they are. And, and yeah. in order to do that, we can't just be you know, stuck in our ivory tower saying, oh, I've got to conduct an symposium because maybe that's not what those students need. Maybe, right. you know, marching band, maybe they need to know what's and have ex relevance to what's going on in, in the current pop culture and try to find ways to integrate that music artistically, right? And tastefully, it can't just be a, a lack or less than arrangement, right? It's got to be good. Right. And so finding that balance where we are trying to find find the students, meet the students so that we don't just include them, but we've got to make sure that we're developing a relationship in a community where they, they feel belong, right? Belonging. I was just in a clinic last yesterday with a, a good friend of mine and um, elementary, uh, elementary teacher, right? He teaches kindergarten. I could not teach kindergarten, but this guy grown man teaches kindergarten, right? And his name is Jeremy White. Check him out. He's, he's fantastic. Um, and, you know, he was talking about the Marvel, the Marvel metaverse, right? And uh, MCU, right? And the way that that organization has developed a franchise to span, what, 20 years of movie making and why? So that we all could can jump on the train at some point and feel like we are a part of this, right? We were a part of this, this development. I think that's what we've, we've got to try to find a way to do in music. Make sure that everybody's included, no matter what their 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 train track is, right? You know, if we can meet at a station that happens to be a band hall, great. If it happens to be down at the the pub and we're listening to some folk folk artists, fantastic. Let's find a way. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that kind of gets us on to one of the topics that you talked about in that article, and that's the 21st century music musician, and we've we've kind of talked quite a bit on that topic and everything, but, you know, Cindy, you mentioned the metaverse and, you know, when you look at the hype surrounding that, you see people creating these characters and these images and, you know, they're actually purchasing these outfits that they, these virtual outfits that they would wear in this virtual community. And, you know, from a musical perspective, as someone who is not only a band director, but also, you know, working with mono music and stuff like that, I look at that and I'm wondering, you know, is that the next market for music composition? And, you know, is that the type of things that composition majors and uh, people should be looking at? You know, the video game industry exploded post the 1990s, right? And, you know, they have these tracks and these themes that just, uh, you know, it's almost like watching a movie and the, the movie soundtracks, you have this, this same elevated music coming out of it. And I'm wondering like, what, when will people start buying their personal theme music or whatever it might be? I don't know. I'm just, uh, when they walk into this virtual universe, they have their own theme there. Uh, and I don't know. I'm just throwing some ideas out there. Uh, yeah, I mean, Jonathan, you, pro you probably have some thoughts on this, but the 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 uh, this Zoom thing that I listened to, there were it was really about four startups, none of which I understood. Right? I mean, I I mean, I'm like I know just enough to be dangerous to use a Brett Bauckham term, which I love. I mean, I I know a little bit about the metaverse. Uh, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I mean, I sort of do, but 
these four startups were, I mean, they were, they were mind blowing, right? I mean, and we aren't, we, why aren't we talking about that in music education? Right. Um, we're not, we're talking about methods classes and I'm not, I'm not dissing method classes. Of course we need to do that. But why are, why isn't higher ed on the forefront of this stuff? We're not, we're sort of, it, it sort of happens over here and then we react to it. Um, and partly it's because young people, generally speaking, are figuring this out. These startups, all, all four of these startups were introduced by people who look like, look young to me. Everybody, everybody looks young. Um, yep. And they were t talking about things like, well, how does that work? But we got to figure this out, right? Yep. Yes, you know, you can go on Facebook and pick an avatar. And people are really, they spend a, quite a few minutes choosing your hair color, your eyebrows, your your glasses or not. What are you wearing? I mean, we're, we'll look back at this conversation 10 years from now and go, isn't that quaint? They were talking about their avatars. That's so cute. <laughs> um, and, 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 but we're doing it, right? We're, all, we're already there. We're already integrating, you know, virtual and artificial intelligence into our lives. If you do any banking, uh, we're there. So uh, um, I think we have to pay attention. What what does that mean for music education and band conducting and et cetera in higher ed? Lots, right? What could it mean? What what does it mean for high school music? Lots, right? I mean, these the, the students in our ensembles will figure this out before we do. Oh, oh right? yeah. So get yeah. them to help us. Yeah. 1000%, right? My students know way more about this kind of stuff than I do. And the more we sit down and, and get to know our students and listen to them, right? And that's, I, th I think that's part of building that sense of community and that belonging is like, really listen, what, what kind of great ideas do they have? And why aren't we implementing some of those ideas? And why do we have to always fit the mold that is put in front of us to say, this is what, this is how we direct our band. This is how we, uh, we we have to perform you know it's like why and yeah but what you're getting at jonathan which is very important if i may is the the expert right we have always seen ourselves as the expert we got a doctorate i know how to fix stuff i got good ears <laughs> hey you're sharp you know all, all of that stuff that we were trained to do we trained our ears we trained our chops we changed our gestures and we want to we want to uh you know we want to do that when we get in our in our gigs. But the era of the expert is over, right? It was over 30 years ago. Uh, and oh, look at that. It's got a little a shift. <laughs> Aaron, nice. <laughs> but it's, it's so I am the place. <laughs> and what, and what, we, we see ourselves as the experts. And in a lot of, you know, get me wrong, we are, right? We, we know a lot. We can read a score. Put, you start displaying a score behind you in in a screen and the first thing kids say is that you can read that all at the same time and we well yes i can I would just, <laughs> you know but but to jonathan's point right and to your point aaron that that shift from the expert is or can be disappearing right crowdsourcing was was common a common term 20 years ago right i used it in an art, article crowdsourcing our rehearsals and getting more input from the students but why not why not do what Jonathan's talking about on a regular basis? Because really the experts are now in our ensembles. If we're talking about avatars, emojis, TikTok, which we should be, and the metaverse, they know more way, way more than we do. And that's very frightening for a lot of us. And you talked about that a little bit in the article and some of your, your own personal journey. Uh, and, and, trying to release the reins that we have clutched so tightly in our hands as band directors. I mean, it's natural for us. I mean, we, we hold the magic wand that creates the music, right? Uh, so, I mean, in our, in our job is important, but, uh, you know, there's been a shift in the 21st century musician and, you know, they can find information like that on their phones. They can, uh, the, the the idea of an expert, a specializer in their minds, I, I wonder how important that is when they can just look up the answer instantaneously. It, are we moving into a new 
type of renaissance where we're having these very diverse backgrounds are we going to have like a um a michelangelo type artist where it's not just one medium but it's in the sciences and the mass and the art and the sculpture and the physical painting uh i don't know yeah i mean uh the fact that you know the world is at your fingertips now our brains have changed right uh I, I, I'm two weeks into a vacation and I still haven't put my phone down. That's right. right? Um, it, it's, I, it's an addiction uh, is one way of looking at it, but it's also, we, we rely very heavily on our phones now and the internet. Uh, I do, I am old enough y'all to remember a world without the internet, but I have no idea how I survive. <laughs> like, how did that happen? Uh, and that, and that's in one that's in one lifetime, right? Wow. And, and we know, right, that, that, that technology is exponentially, in, you know, moving ahead of us, moving ahead of our understanding of what it can do. Um, what does that mean for music education and education? Are we still giving tests and grades based on memorization? What the, why? You know, uh, and, and of course, there's merit to memorization and internalization. I'm not saying that we should never do that. But the old way of testing, come on, right? And, and, and music advocacy folks say, well, what we do in the band room, the choir room, the orchestra room is different, right, than what happens in the math room. Are you kidding me? They flipped their crap classrooms years ago. They're, they're problem solving in, in their classes and rehearsals. Are we? Right. No. My thought regarding the the whole cell phone, you know, the the, the absolute connectedness and the ability to get information instantaneously. My thought is: Are we asking the right questions, and are we empowering our students to uh, think to the higher level thinkings, or are we asking the questions that we asked 30, 40, 50 years ago? And how can we utilize such a technology to further enhance our classroom? You know what I mean? And so that, like you just said, Cindy, you know, okay, so, all right, fingerings. I mean, yes, as directors, we need to know our fingerings, but I mean, there's an app for that, <laughs> right? You know, and yes, it's important, but what, if we're just quizzing our students on well, how do you spell a major sixth? Okay, yeah, that's important to know, but why is that important to know? And I think it's that question that is often missed. And how is that going to inter develop an interpretation? And how is that then going to make the music meaningful, right? And and why is that important for you personally? It might be important for me as a conductor, but how is this relevant to you, the student, and why, right? And I think it's those higher level things that. We, we might not be asking ourselves enough in our classrooms and, and giving our uh, the students the opportunity to to go that far. You know, I don't know. Thoughts I've had. <laughs> you know, one of the eye openers that I had just last semester was uh, I programmed Brian Balmage's arithmetic number one which is the piece that uh, he wrote during COVID for small groups. And the way it's set up is you have five different sections. And within that section, the students have the ability to choose whichever line they want to play. And they can play it multiple times. They can go back and go to the top. They can jump down to the bottom. They can play whatever. And then the conductor gives a, an instruction to move on to the next section. And then it just kind of goes. So there's a lot of choice in there and from a band perspective giving the students that choice was a challenge for them when we first started working on that piece of music because they're so used to here's the music this is the notes that you're being played uh that you're expected to play this is and i'm going to tell you how we're going to shape this i'm going to tell you how we're going to phrase this i'm going to tell you when to breathe we're going to mark it in there and all this other stuff and you know it, it was an eye-opener for me when it came to how well am I teaching my kids to make good musical decisions? Yeah, musical independence is what you're talking about, right? Right. And, and we're not we're not teaching that necessarily in in how we've traditionally taught band 
to get ready for the performance. Um, yeah, that, Brian has written a very cool, I mean, it's not a new, no offense to Brian, it's not a new concept, right? I mean, right. That, to, that, that kind of aleatory. But the, the things that you can teach and have, that's now you're talking about deep listening. So I'm not just going to go do this again because I feel like it. I'm, you know, the next level of that is, are you listening? You know, hey, Terry, is, is Sarah beside you, you know, playing louder or softer than you? Those, those kind of questions that Paula Kreider you know, asks in rehearsals. I mean, that woman is brilliant. Right. Um, and so, but it, you can get that kind of teaching improvisation or making musical choices or when to be silent, right? Because, it, because it's for the greater good, because I'm actually grooving on. Now you're talking, actually, you're getting to artistic level of music making, right? I just, I want to play because it sounds good and I can play really loud. Okay, that's, that's fine. <laughs> Let's go to the next level, right? Um, what happens when you don't play here? Can you hear this? Can you hear that? And what happens when you play this a little softer, right? Um, what if you go back here? Oh, I think that this will fit. Why? Because there's a major six in it. And I, I know that that major six is going to sound, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's so many things that you can do in that that we don't do, as you say, when we stand on a box with a stick, tell them what to do, when to do, and how to do it. I also wonder if... Oh, are we connecting this abstract thing like music to to what they really know and are interested in often? And I say that because this year, one of my, my goals is to try to get, develop that artistic nuance that is independent for the student. Right. And so in my years here at Elon, you know, we've 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 grown a long way. But really, the question is, is how is that really affecting their independence as musicians so that when I put a piece of music in front of them, can they sight read? the tune, whatever it is, whatever grade level it is, artistically. And nine times out of 10, I'm going to say, no, we're just worried about notes and rhythms. Right. But is that really music? Like, I mean, we can put that in finale or, you know, we're coming up with all these AIs that can compose music like Bach. And it, you know, a lot of times it kind of sounds like Bach. Right. And so what if we took something like poetry? We, hopefully we all know whatever language, right? And explore the nuance of poetry and then talk about those musicings, you know, the phrasing of poetry, the dynamics of poetry, the, the rate at which we are speaking these texts and how does that and change the interpretation of the message we're trying to convey and then transition that into music and say the same thing, right? And, and maybe we need to, to use the buzzword, you know, scaffold, this artistic nuance a little bit differently rather than just standing on the box and saying, no, we've got to add a crescendo here. Well, why? Right. What's the point? I don't know. That's an experiment I'm going to conduct this year. Well, I'll tell you, I, the more I think about it and I am convinced that Harold Hill was actually a brilliant music educator because of his think method, because, uh, you know, he was doing it out of his uh, uh, ignorance of music. But, you know, how often do we ask, well, how do you think it goes? How do you think you do that? How do you think that? Or are we more prone to just saying this? Middle finger, middle finger, two and three, two and three. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I the. We have to, Jonathan said earlier, we have to ask the right questions, right? I mean, if, if you, cause I had this experience at Cornell where, and I've said this, I've said this many times, this story when I was Google Glass Explorer, this all happened at, at Cornell, but I went to a, a, a presentation and, and they, they talked about um, taking a, a, a guy from the 19th century and plopping him into Times Square, right? And, and opening his eyes and he would be absolutely freaked out, right? The noise, the fashion, the lights, the neon, the cars, everything would freak him out until he walked into a classroom. Mm. And, you know, cause really not a lot has changed in, in how we, in the physical setup of a classroom. Now there might, there's a whiteboard instead of a chalkboard. I mean, they might be sitting in circles and, instead of rows, but basically the same has changed. I got thinking, well, what, what if you took somebody from the Sousa band and plopped him into my band room from the night. And it, he, because it would be me, uh, would, it would know where to sit. He, he would say, what's with all the percussion? But he would basically know where to sit. And so is that okay? 
yeah, of course, tradition matters, right? But as but Jonathan has said, has asked the question a few times now, why? And that's really, really an important question. Uh, Simon Sinek wrote a book called Start With Why. It, it's it's really a good read. And whether you're in leadership and, and music educators are leaders, conductors, it's a very good read. Um, and, but when you start, if you start asking students these questions, how do you, what do you think this means? How do you, th is this a four measure phrase, two measure phrase, you know, eight measure phrase? What do you think? You're going to get a lot of blank stares, right? right? Because they haven't been taught that way. Right. They have no idea like where to start. So you have, you have to come at this using the internet probably in, in a virtual, in a virtual way, right? Which is how it worked for me. Um, you have to ask the right questions. And that's why conductors need to talk to music educators. And in higher ed, that's, there is a two silos there. Let's, let's be real um, and talk about how those synergies can happen. I mean, there's silos all over the place in higher ed, but it's also happening in high schools, right? We do music in this room. We do science in this room. We do math in this room. And then we go outside here and do this and have soccer practice. You know, I say this all the time, but Steve Jobs was asked about, God, man, how did you get so creative and develop the Apple computer? And he said, Creat creativity is just about making connections. Mm. Creative people get a little embarrassed when they're asked about it because they just saw something after a while. Are we creating those situations in our curriculum? I don't know. It's harder. It's harder to sit down. Yeah you know, the soccer coach, the math teacher, the science teacher, and, and, and talk about what connections can possibly be made. But of course they're there. Of course they're there. And yeah. schools need to make space for those conversations to happen and that, and that, and that curriculum to happen. So you touched on it um, a little bit earlier uh, when we started talking about the collaborations between the hip hop artists and the wind ensemble, what you did down in Georgia, what Ken is getting ready to do uh, with his venture. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on repertoire within the wind band community? I mean, and I know that we've only got about uh, seven minutes left in our conversation, but, uh, and I, maybe that's a can of worms right there, but uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> Jonathan, go ahead. You you start on this one. What 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 is the speaking of asking the right questions, Aaron? Not that per se, but what is your question? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, maybe it's just a a guiding conversation point. But what are your thoughts on where repertoire is for the wind band in the twenty first century? Well, I th where, I think where do we stand? And, you know, going back to what you said, uh, how how much innovation have we seen? You know, we, we can point to different innovations from, you know, the music that Sousa played and what we hear today. Uh, but I I wonder how relevant it is to our culture because Sousa's band was highly highly relevant to the communities that he went to and he would play um, music specific he would program music specifically for the communities that he was going to when he was doing his tours well i'll, I'll say that with a story from one of my mentors at georgia george foreman you know oftentimes i'd ask george to come check out the wind ensemble concert and he said jonathan why would i want to go listen to a bunch of beeps and boops <laughs> If I wanted to listen to a melody, I would, right? And, like, there's some validity there. But at the same time, it's like, okay, come on. Come on, Dr. Foreman. Like, what are we doing, right? We're, I think that we're still oftentimes working within this box. And I wonder, why, why does that have to be a box? Why can't it be a, an oval? You know, why, why, why are we still, well, so many thoughts are going through my head right now. There's, yes, we have to honor some of our traditions that we do that makes us wind band, right? And that's our, our medium. That's what 
we are in this profession as music educators for a reason. And we are, we are here in band because it, it means something to us. And so if we can share that with our students, I think that is, you know, that's ultimately the goal. And we do that through music, right? We, we teach students, we teach students about music through band. I think that's what we do. And the rep that we s select, right? You know, we've heard this adage, every time we say yes to one piece, we say no to everything else. And yes, I believe that we are moving the pendulum mm -hmm. a little bit, especially when we can open the can of worms of diversity and inclusion. We're kind of getting there, but compared to everywhere else in society, we have so many, so much further to go, I think. And um, I think that comes down to conductors commissioning folks and having ideas, right, and, and being willing to take artistic risks with with um, with composers and say, you know what, let's let's do something different, and or, okay, we've got blue and yellow. Well, what happens when we put those two together, you know, in a musical sense, right? And how can we combine various genres so that we create something new? Like Cindy said earlier, you know, we keep starting to expand or create new genres, right? And, and find ways to, to connect with our students. I, I mean, it, it, here at Elon, I have to connect with my students. If I'm not connecting with my students, no matter what I do, I mean, I could play the, the most cornerstone piece of music and it wouldn't matter because they're like, why? What's the point? It doesn't mean anything. And so I, I think it's all about finding ways to, to share with them our musical journey and our growth that we are still constantly on and still trying to catch up to um, and, and help, help them get on the, that train. I don't know. Cindy, your thoughts? I don't know. what. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think I made you do this. I mean, I made you read Who Cares If You Listen by, uh, yeah, of course. by who, Jonathan? Well, it was by Babbitt, right? Yeah, good. I'm just, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, and, you know, I, I, I make grad students read that every year, and make no mistake, I care who listens. Uh, and that Babbitt, I mean, name one piece by Babbitt, right? Uh, uh, and so, you know, he didn't care if he listened because he was protected by the ivory tower, and he believed that to to advance the the, the art of music. It needed to be incomprehensible to the public. That's what he thought. Fascinating, right? I mean, to, and to some extent, that's a very interesting, that's very interesting. I mean, I ha would have this conversation at Cornell. Look, we are in one of the top research institutions in the world. Shouldn't we be doing the same in band? You know, a lot of students were like, no, I do that all day. I just came to play, man. You know, so, right. but, 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 so there, that, that is, Argument is valid and interesting, but I care if you listen, and we should all care about our audience, right? This, these are one of the elements of our performances and even our rehearsals that we should care deeply about, right? Uh, and ask questions of. We keep talking about the folks in our ensemble, but what are the folks who choose to come to our performances? Are we are we engaging with them in very interesting ways? I don't know. Um, so I think that when we, your question about repertoire and where are we heading in the 21st century, the answer is, I don't know. Uh, but I, I mean, I do think that we are, we are still beholden to publishers, no offense, Aaron. Uh, they, we, we, music educators, high school band directors are very busy. There are so many demands on time, uh, especially if you're doing marching band that you, you know, you go to Midwest, you go to the major publishers and you, you, you know, you pick what's on the rack, right? Um, as opposed to doing the work. And the reason it's hard to do the work is because of time, right? And right. so that's why these sites, uh, and we were heard, you know, composerdiversity.com and all the other ones that are cropping up that are, that are exploring works by underrepresented composers. And make no mistake, these underrepresented composers are underrepresented because of a system that elevates some and push down others. And so, and those underrepresented voices are different. Right. So I think some people, when they talk about quality in repertoire, listen to music by some underrepresented composers and go, I don't like that. Well, you don't, you know, it just, it sounds different than what you're, what the music that's been elevated for a hundred years, right? That's, that, so I won't say you don't like it. 
It's not about taste. Quality isn't about taste. <laughs> Someone right. like it or not. What are your what are your criteria for quality? What is it? When you ask a lot of people at Midwest, we're really good at walking around and dissing performances and repertoire. We're really good at that. But tell me what makes good music. What are what are what defines that for you? What what are the elements? That's hard. But yeah. let's you know, let's have that conversation. Start to develop that. What what are the elements? I mean, there's a really good book out there. I can't think of his name, John somebody. He wrote about why why we love music. One of the elements is repetition. Mm. And that's mm. a major criticism of repertoire at Midwest. Oh, it's so repetitive. Dude, have you listened to Mozart? Come on. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> you know, having that's another thing, though, that we're not very good at teaching in higher ed is let's have conversations about what does quality mean? And, you know, who has decided this in, a, in the past? Right. Who continues to decide this? But what does it mean for you? Charles Peltz does a wonderful talk on this, right? Uh, uh, you know, he's a fascinating thinker on this stuff, right? But one of my elements is that, you know, all the repetition, right? It's important to me, which is why when we're premiering new works, we'll often, you know, play little motives from the music beforehand so that we kind of trick the audience and they go, oh, I've heard that before. That's why I like this new piece, right? So, you know, I mean, there's just enough in, in a piece that I'm conductors or composers send me scores all the time and I'll look through them and I'll, because I'm also busy, I'll listen to the MIDI or whatever. And, and there's just enough that my expectations are satisfied, but there's something about it that's like, oh, I, I didn't think they would go there. So that's one of, that's one element, element for me. But what, you know, Jonathan, what's one of your elements? So Aaron, what's one of your elements? Listeners. What are some of the elements for you that define quality? Stop going at it negatively. Like that's bad music because X, Y, and Z. No, we'll think of it. This is good music because A, B, and C. Start right. developing that. You know, it's, uh, and we're, we're over an hour and I guess I, but I just wanted to comment on something that both of you uh, had two really great points. Jonathan, you were talking about relationship with the students that you're teaching and stuff like that and the comparison between you know programs that are not the university of georgia wind ensemble that are not the north texas wind symphony that aren't the eastman wind ensemble uh you know those ensembles the the members of that ensemble are there to play the war horses and stuff like that uh if we don't have that ensemble we can't expect to, um, well, I've got to draw the students into my ensemble and find, build that relationship. And then we can show them some of these uh, great works that were written uh, for wind band. The things that, you know, appeal to me, but at the same time, I've got to find those relationships with them and find the music that speaks to them as individuals. And uh, Cindy, you were talking about what kind of stood out to me was our familiarity with music. And a lot of that is based on our culture, uh, whether on a micro level or a macro level. And that difference in culture kind of, uh, this summer I had the pleasure of directing a pet band for a baseball club, the uh, Burlington Sock Puppets. And uh, it was a blast, I loved it. But uh, one of the students that was in the group, uh, he's a trombone player. He is um, Indian by heritage. He's uh, American, He's uh, but he's Indian. His parents uh, immigrated from India, uh, his grandparents uh, maybe. But I was talking to his mom and she was talking about her mother. So this student's this trombone player's grandmother. Uh, and she would invite her to the concerts, the band concerts and, you know, it just did not speak to her at all. And it got me thinking, and you know, from a Western ear, especially an older white male Western ear, when I listen to Indian music, uh, you know, it draws me in because it is so vastly different mm -hmm. from what I'm used to, you know? Mm -hmm. But that draw comes from my life being a musician, somebody who's not familiar, who hasn't spent their life 
musicking their entire time, if they listen to that new music, would probably be turned off and shut down and stuff like that. And, and it just kind of highlights as an educator what another aspect of our role is to is to expand these young musicians' horizons and expose them to culturally diverse music. And, uh, you know, not to just do the politically correct term right now, but vastly different cultural music and stuff like that. And Right on. Yeah. I love that. I, I mean, and you talked about the difference, some of the difference between Canada and the United States. That's a big one, too. I mean, you can walk downtown Toronto and hear 20 different languages in one block, right? I mean, it's an incredibly, it's a different way of the immigration system in Canada. It's come and be who you are. Right, so there's Greek town, Chinatown, Indie town, et cetera, in downtown Toronto. In the states, it's a little different. You come, yeah, come, uh, and be American, right? Uh, assimilate. So it's a. Right. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but it's a. It's a different system, and so uh, maybe I'm saying one is better than the other. <laughs> I am secretly saying, uh, but but the it's so important in Canadian society to think about the kind of uh, diverse peoples that are now make up you at uh, this, this country is Canadian. And, and we are having those conversations in our, in our music programs as well. Right. And so, you know, a, a Susan March, a piece by Brian uh, uh, and, and Randall Sandridge aren't going to cut it. Love, love those three composers. Right. But it's not going to work. Right. These, this is not representing the folks, the students, that are in our ensembles. And so we could do a lot more as high school music educators, band directors, certainly as deans, as, as college band directors, as middle school band directors, into thinking differently about, are we really, keep, do we keep commissioning the same folks to write this very good music? I mean, that, I mean it's unbelievable. Can we be thinking differently about this? Um, can we be, Taking taking music, I just listened to B fifty. Remember the first time you heard B fifty twos out of Athens? They're about to go on tour again. I mean, those folks, man, did they break down some boundaries, right? Huge wide appeal, a very different kind of music making. Why aren't we doing that in in Winnipeg? Well, I guess uh, we just need to find that little love place. <laughs> That was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I had Atlanta to go there Highway. with the beat 52 reference. Uh, <laughs> on Atlanta Highway, you know? Yep. <laughs> yeah, go look. down to Athens. <laughs> Find your love shack, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, listen, we are eight minutes over the hour, and I, I, I am never good at ending these things right in an hour. So, uh, Cindy, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk with us tonight. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on. We're going to end the show, but if you two will stick around a little bit longer uh, after the show, I'd love to talk to you real soon. But thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and, you know, in reading uh, Bill Perrine's book, The Future of the Wind Band, one of the driving themes throughout is that right now we don't have the answers and we may never find the answer and hopefully we won't ever find the answer but what we're talking about is to get people talking to have these conversations to discuss these things and find ways to not do the thing but to do what we do better and i hope that through all of this our conversations help all of you to uh, become better band directors, be better educators, and better community leaders. I hope you guys enjoyed tonight, and we'll see you next time. Bye.